so I'm joined today by my colleagues, John Chalu, uh, Lindsay Campbell, and Erica Spenson. And we're going to um, spend a little time first just talking about our data sets um, around the stewardship mapping and assessment projects. And um, then go through some possible projects you guys could work on. I'm, I'm moving introductions for all of us to sort of introduce ourselves to each other a little later, just because I know some folks are still taking some time to join and, and want to make sure everybody says hi to everybody. Um, and then we'll get into the logistics of the hackathon, make sure everybody kind of understands how to communicate, things like that. And then we'll break into teams and still sort of trying to decide we'll either join breakout rooms here in Zoom or we'll switch over to Discord, um, just sort of depending on, on how folks think about that. Um, and that'll wrap us up for the, the end of the evening. So first, um, just sort of, I've been talking about the stewardship mapping and assessment project. It relates to stewardship, but what is stewardship and why are we studying it? So stewardship is taking care of the local environment. That's That's how our team um, defines it. And there's different ways to think about what stewardship is in terms of actions. And so here's six different functions um, in that kind of comprise our definition of stewardship. And so it could be anybody that's managing the local environment, um, conserving, that could be, you know, engaging in uh, land conservation or going out to protect a garden, um, monitoring, so uh, monitoring for oysters with the Billion Oyster Project, or going out and um, counting and collecting information on trees. Uh, transformation, so engaging in um, thinking about systems like waste systems or energy systems, advocacy, and then environmental education. And so th that's sort of our, our kind of working definition of what stewardship is. And um, we've then been using this StuMap approach to go out and collect data on these um, civic environmental stewardship groups. So we've been really interested in not just how individuals, like as a, as a you know, a volunteer, um, you might go out and, and do something that helps take care of the local environment, but often you're doing it as part of a group. And so we're interested in understanding these groups, where they are in the city, um, how they're doing this, these kinds of um, actions or functions, and then why they're caring for the local environment and also how they're working together or not working together to, um, to do this work. And so it's a survey and interview-based methodology. The data I'm gonna share and we're gonna talk about today is mostly the, the survey. Um, and we started here in New York City, Erica and Lindsay uh, built this whole um, approach to research and collected the first StuMap data in 2007. We've then um, gone back here in New York City and collected the data again in 2017. That's the data set um, I'm most going to focus on and have us look at today. Um, but we've also done this work in more than 15 locations in, in the United States and also around the world. And the questions that are on the survey we send to groups are um, enabling us to, to know something about the organizations or the groups, like how many staff or volunteer they have, um, what's the year they were founded, um, what kind of budget do they have, and then also um, getting into geospatial data, looking at where do these groups work. And so that can be um, a, thinking about it in terms of a territory or a turf. We usually use kind of those words interchangeably. So if you hear us say that, we're, we're really thinking of a polygon that represents um, where these groups um, define their, their kind of area that they focus their work on. And then we also um, ask questions to, to understand what kind of site do they steward? So are they focused on street trees, on um, uh, park lands, on community gardens, on um, uh, just the streetscape in general? And um, the third type of data are network data. So we ask these groups, um, who else do you work with? And from those responses, we can turn those into social network data sets and um, start to look at, at kind of how these connections are, are happening, where there are connections, um, who's the critical brokers that are enabling um, transference of, of information and, and resources between different organizations. 
And um, so that's kind of like what, what to expect to see on, the, on the, the data. And this is just to give you a sense of um, what the data sets will look like um, in terms of structure. So we've got these 2007 and 2017 data sets. We have them in kind of like separate entities. And um, they, what I've mostly provided in uh, a resources folder I'll share later is the 2017 data, but we can easily add that the 2007 or show you where on a website to download it. So the data are in a spatial um, file geo database, and we have office locations represented as points. We have um, turfs of where these groups are working represented as polygons. And then attached to each of those are the responses from the survey. But we also have those responses just as a CSV file or an XLS file. Um, and we have a data dictionary. And then we have the network data represented um, as a node list and edge list, which um, I can talk about a little more later. But that's essentially um, how the, how the network data are structured and work in a certain software that I'll talk about. And so you can access the data. Um, you know, if they're they're open data, they're not New York City open data, but they are freely available. We have um, the data available as a uh, kind of streaming feature service on uh, uh, Esri's ArcGIS feature. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, enterprise server. And uh, so here's a link that goes to the REST API. So you can drag it in if you're um, wanting to pull it into a um, uh, GIS um, software. And then we also have the data um, available as a zip file on our website. And also um, we have interactive maps there as well for people that are not um, as used to using GIS data, they can still explore all the data um, just in an interactive online map. And so right now I'm gonna just show you the data because um, I'm, I'm talking about the structure, but I think it will make most sense just to do a quick demo of, um, and I'm gonna show it in the form of a story map um, that we've been working on. And it'll show these office locations, these overlapping polygons of turfs, show the network data. And then we also have um, some kind of newer ways of visualizing the data that are, are not quite up on our website yet, where we've aggregated these data to um, neighborhood tabulation areas. You can choose to aggregate it to, to other um, aerial um, ways as well. And then we've also created an, an index that, that draws upon the, the survey responses to create a, a stewardship index of um, separate capacity. So give me just a minute to, to switch. And uh, so, um, the story map has kind of an overview um, that just shows you what the data look like and that, you know, these are those turfs and kind of the lines are all these different groups saying kind of where they work in New York City and out into the, the broader metro area. And then these um, orange dots are the office locations. And right now, I don't think we have this part working fully. Um, well, let's see if it does load, but basically the, the attribute data of the, there we go, great, it is working. The attribute data um, that's tagged to those points and polygon data, you can, you can graph them and kind of look at um, how different responses look um, from the, the software itself, um, sorry, from the survey itself, and also just some static kind of total numbers. How many groups are mapped in the data set? How many members? Of those 825 groups are there, how many volunteers, um, how many full-time staff. And then the, the network data, um, we don't look at that in uh, kind of geographic space in, on a map. Instead, we, we look at it in network space. And so um, this is Kumu software that we've been using to, to look at this with, and it should take just a minute to, to load up. With the, the New York City data, it's pretty large, so it, it can take a little while to map. So um, we'll, we'll also share this, this link um, you know, in the chat in a minute, but uh, so you guys can navigate to it later. I've also made a copy of this that I can share with folks if anyone's interested in, in kind of starting here and exploring where to go. Um, and I can talk about that later in a minute too, but 
essentially the, the diagram gives you a little bit of overview of, of what you're looking at. And then um, essentially what you're seeing is groups color as dots. If they're civic groups, they're green, businesses, they're blue, schools, they're purple, and government is orange. And um, you can zoom in on this map, this network diagram, to see, um, start seeing the labels of these groups. And if you wanted to kind of subset, let's look at partnerships for parks. Um, we can just look at their connections. Um, why that is taking a minute. Um, we can look at just their connections, or we can also kind of look at who those groups are in turn connected to. And we can expand all the way out or um, contract to look at kind of subsets of the, the network that way. Um, it can be a cool thing to start with one group and just sort of explore, like, how do you get into all the other organizations that way? And we can also kind of subset this, um, this network by some of the survey responses. So those different um, functions of groups, whether they um, manage or transform or advocate or conserve, we can just look at the management um, network. And so you can see it's it's a subset of that larger network. We can also you know, look at that plus advocacy if we want it, for example, um, reset that. And, um, and we can do the same for site types. So if, you know, if we want to look at groups that work with street trees, we can just subset the network that way. You can also say, I want to look at groups that manage um, the local environment and focus on uh, street trees. So you can kind of go across these. Sorry, it's just taking a minute to um, And the third one is group focus. And what that is, is, you know, so far I've been talking about stewardship specifically, but these groups are not all solely focused on the um, local environment. And so we can switch and look at group focus. And we can say, oh, I, I really want to look at groups that are focused on education and their networks. Um, so then we can kind of subset it that way, for example, or groups that are focused on housing. Because a lot of these um, efforts to sort of take care of the larger social ecological system that is New York City um, are, are intersectional. And so a lot of these other kind of um, focus areas that maybe not are not the environment um, are, are kind of overlapping issues, and you can really see that here. So I'm going to flip back um, let's see, to the last bit that I wanted to go over on this map. Um, well, a couple more things. One is this is just an example of that, the interactive map you can get to from our website. So it allows you to, the story map allows you to see it from within, but we have it already kind of live up and you can kind of click on a um, particular group, um, like a turf area and see who, who is that group that is working there. Unfortunately, when I, um, these things are a little slow when I'm sharing my screen as well, but I clicked, I clicked just a point and it's saying there's 16 turfs that are in that area and you, know, you can kind of flip through and see who are these groups and they're showing up as like the, the turquoise, um, showing the different kind of extents of these groups. So we'll put the um, link to the interactive map in the chat so you guys can explore um, the data that way as well. And then this last piece of, of the way of looking at the stew map data is, is so far everything I've shown you is, is kind of raw data from um, the stew map survey without it sort of being integrated or summarized or just straight, you know, here's information about each group and then how they're related to other groups. But we can look at um, uh, kind of some of the attributes of groups. So here it is number of groups per neighborhood. So we've taken those stacked polygons and counted them, counted overlapping polygons and can see that um, per, per neighborhood. And then on the right-hand side, we've done similar sort of metrics for other variables. So this is surface temperature, um, but we can flip that to be like number of community gardens instead if we wanted to. And so you can kind of flip back and forth and look at the relationships between 
the number of groups um, per neighborhood and some of these other social and environmental variables that describe those neighborhoods. And we've switched, um, sorry, I shouldn't say switched, but we've added on where um, in addition to number of groups, we can look at number of staff um, per, per um, neighborhood. And then number of alters means kind of numbers of connections. So how many of those collaborative connections are you seeing in the social networks? And together, we've, we've created an index of those three variables. So number of groups, number of staff, number of alters um, into uh, an index that's so, sort of we're right now um, just have just recently created this and are thinking this is a good measure of civic capacity. And so part of the reason I'm explaining some of these things is we, you know, as one of the teams, we'll get into this a little later, we would love for you guys to potentially explore this, explore the data in relationship to climate change or other disturbances. And so I'm going to switch back to the slides. And um, we'll start talking about the, the teams that we had sort of said, hey, you guys could um, potentially split up into these teams. And um, I had sent a, a survey around and, and so, um, it sounded like folks were interested in, in all of the teams. So that's kind of good to hear. And for this first one, this is focused on um, our StuMap Live and organizational approach. I'm going to turn it over to John to um, maybe walk us through a little bit of this team and what might be involved. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you hear me? You're a little quiet. Okay, I, yeah, I will speak louder. Um, so we um, have been thinking about ways to make sure that we have current data that we can um, go back to. And then StuMap is not a uh, not an effort that only collects data every 10 years, but we have some way of updating information about who we reach out to. And um, for that effort, we've tried to come up with many uh, different ways. Um, so far, we have been using the IRS's records for the nonprofits, the 990s, um, and trying to merge our steward steward map data together with that to um, have a to have a list of groups at the end of the day. And we've created uh, one tool so far using Esri software, allowing people to update their information um, on the, in, in the data set. And if we can go to the next image, I mean, we don't necessarily need to go over every single thing, but we ended up coming up with kind of a complicated uh, flowchart where we collect data from multiple different sources. This can be existing databases coming from uh, local groups or from stu stewardship groups. Um, existing StuMap data, if it's if StuMap has been run more than one time in a location, maybe actually an old StuMap data as well. We have the 990s, and if we have any list, how can we like batch upload them? And what this creates is, of course, a bit of a problem because on one hand side we have a um, extremely complete data set that has about like 90 different fields or questions, uh, but it's getting old every day because the, map, the full map is done every 10 years. And on the other side, we have data set that we compiled, but we practically have only what these groups do uh, their, and their addresses. They're not even geocoded. So um, this effort is trying to come up with a way to merge them and create workflows that will allow for these two data sets to coexist and once in a while, you know, support each other. So, um, yeah, we have two main questions. One of them is, um, can we actually find a better way to access more groups that can be useful for steward uh, to take the full stu stewardship link, full stew map survey? And um, how do we combine these two separate data sets? And that um, I think maybe like else I can add one more is um, even when we have a data set, how do we make sure uh, to have a data structure that allows for integrating uh, constant updates as well? Is there um, anything else you wanted to add, Michelle? Um, no, I think that's it. Thanks, John. Sorry, I was just trying to get to the unmute button. Um, great. So that's that's team one. Um, and so these are 
kind of possible ideas we've we've been thinking out. The second is is data visualization. And so that's um, part of the reason I spent a lot of time showing that story map is just to show kind of like, here's some things we've done so far. And I'm going to show a few more of um, kind of just things we have done. These are what those turfs look like if you zoomed in and just looked at a single turf. Um, they can be, you know, a group is, is defined by the parcel boundaries of a community garden, the boundaries of a borough, um, multiple parcels uh, across different boroughs, or um, in the case of East River Crew Incorporated, um, we drew the boundary along, it kind of up the East River to the mouth of uh, Long Island Sound. And so we can see that stewards work across sites and scales, right? They're working at it can, sometimes at these smaller scales, sometimes they're working at a whole citywide area or even further outside of the city. And, they, um, you know, right now we have had challenges with sort of visualizing this once you want to start stacking things on each other. Um, and that sort of leads to the next slide the, on the right hand side. That is the way we've been kind of visualizing these groups together is, is um, I showed you before we had aggregated them to neighborhood tabulation areas and just did a count. Here's a direct overlap of the turfs together. So the more red it is, the more um, groups there are working in that part of the city and the, the lighter orange it is, um, the fewer groups there are working in that part of the city. And um, maybe there's some other ways to, to, to look at how to visualize the data. We also, on the left-hand side, um, with the, our interactive map, we have kind of ways to look at organizational capacity by just kind of um, looking at some of the, the responses to the survey. So if, like, as I showed you earlier, if you clicked on a turf, you can see some of the information about a group and you can see that um, uh, that represents their capacity, like number of staff, not the you know budget size, um, and some other information about those those groups. And we've also taken some of the other survey responses. We asked some Likert scale questions of how groups think their that what their outcomes are, and we've asked them kind of ecological outcomes, like effects on habitat and plant quality. Also social outcomes like effects on participation, community participation or ability to enact changes in policies. And right now what you're looking at is maps where we took those and um, in aggregate said for this neighborhood, here's the average Likert scale um, for that social, that, um, social variables and ecological variables based on what we asked on the, um, the survey. And so there's definitely lots of opportunities to, to play around with the, that visualization. You can see these are not very exciting maps. I did these very quickly. And there's some real opportunities to, to think about how to display the attributes of um, the survey results. And there's a lot of different things to unpack in the data dictionary. So there's also opportunities to play with the, the network data. And I think Lindsay put a link to the, um, the Kumu uh, project in the chat. And I've got a second kind of copy of that made that if folks want to play around with the, the network data, one, um, there's access to the raw network file, but there's also data already loaded in Kumu if you want to play around with um, changing ways of visualizing or exploring that. And so I'm happy to add folks to that second um, kind of uh, copy project. And, any, and um, all you have to do first is sign up for a Kumu account. Um, and we'll come back to that in a minute too. But so essentially there's just kind of all sorts of opportunities with, with this sort of team is, is thinking about um, how else can we, um, let folks interact with the data or visualize the data. We've made this stewardship capacity index. That's just those three variables, number of groups per neighborhood, number of connections per neighborhood, and uh, number of staff per neighborhood. But maybe there's a better way to, to create an index, or maybe there's a different kind of index you'd want to play with, or 
Um, maybe there's some other ways of um, making interactive maps or, or thinking about the network data. So that's kind of team two. It's very an open-ended, um, broad, you know, what kind of data visualization do you want to uh, play around with? So team three is um, text analysis and ways of displaying those, those texts. And so what we have is for the survey questions, we have some open-ended questions. And those types of questions you have to code um, to, to get meaning out of it in a way that you can sort of synthesize or, or, or display, right? And so what we've done um, is we coded the 2017 data for um, the mission. So you know, we asked a group, what is your mission? And usually um, most groups will have a kind of official mission statement. Other groups will say, oh, generally our, you know, we're trying to pick up litter in um, you, you know, uh, Hell's Kitchen. And, and that's, you know, they sort of have a ad hoc mission for lack of a better word. So we've done this for 2017, but we haven't done it for 2007. So there's definitely some opportunities to um, look at how we could um, code those 2007, but um, we have been doing it manually. And um, there's also ways of you know, doing topic models or some other sort of um, linguistics uh, approaches in R, Python, other programs. Uh, where you could kind of tackle that problem for our 2007 data. And I've also made a little um, subset of Twitter data for some of our stewardship groups and added it to our resources folder. So there, um, there's also a lot of room to like, what is the content of these tweets? What are groups tweeting about? Are there any general categories? And so that, that leads us um, into some of our questions. Like we're really interested in, how can we take those text data and link it to the spatial and network data that team three, or sorry, team two is exploring? So there could be some like crosstalk here. Um, how can we visualize those text data um, and kind of visualize, like we really don't, um, haven't really given a lot of thought to, you know, beyond like a, a Wordle or something like that, you know, or a word cloud how to, you know, what are data visualizations we can do with text data. Um, and then there's also this automated coding opportunity I was talking about where you could do topic models or something like that, or we're also interested in potentially all of those different stewardship actions I was talking about before, management, conservation, uh, transformation, education, advocacy. Are groups in the tweets, are they talking about these kinds of um, actions and can we pick it up by maybe making a, a lexicon that could then kind of go through and, and code tweets to say this is the kind of stewardship this group's engaging in based on this you know these kinds of tweets so those are really open-ended um, kind of ways there's lots of wiggle room and different ways to go and um, we can talk about the the specific data um, related to these uh, later but that's it for team three, and I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay for team four. Awesome. All right, bringing it home. Um, I'm excited to introduce this one. Oh, maybe go back a slide, Michelle, just to be clear on terms. Um, does it go back? Okay. So we are really interested in the way stewards work in a context of disturbance. Um, we've been doing this work for a couple of decades now, and we found often that stewardship emerges um, in a post-disaster window. We've looked at stewardship after September 11th, after Hurricane Sandy, after tornadoes. Um, we've done research in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is a patterned response we've seen that people sort of emerge and organize. Now, there are also slower moving presses that are um, fundamentally kind of shaping our experience in the urban environment, like climate change. And we want to understand stewardship in that context. Um, when Michelle showed you the slide about social and ecological outcomes, you know, stewards produce environmental effects. They help improve air quality, water quality. They take care of trees that affect, you know, the urban heat islands. So there's the whole ecological set of linkages, but there are also really, really important social linkages that 
we want to bring to the fore. Um, if you, as if any of you know Eric Kleinenberg's work, the heat wave book or other things he's written about social infrastructure, he's found that, you know, if you know your neighbors, then you're better and you trust them, you're better po poised to sort of weather whatever the issue is that comes your way. So um, we think that understanding, you know, social trust and social cohesion and the work that stewards do on the ground um, is really relevant to thinking about how we adapt to climate change. So on the next slide, um, you can see some beautiful maps that John has made um, using StuMap data, which I wish you could zoom all the way in and see these um, hexagons. He's covered a big wall at the Queens Museum, but on the left, this is overlaying um, flood zones in blue. Uh, the orange tone is urban heat island, high urban heat areas, and the green tones are where stewards work. So we can obviously look for overlaps of areas that are going to um, be affected by climate change. We could also look for um, how that intersects with social vulnerability. We can use the whole set of census data. And again, you could look at this uh, at the neighborhood tabulation area, or maybe you want to look at particular stewardship group territories or turfs in some of these uh, highly affected or vulnerable areas. Um, climate change is not the only disturbance that stewards uh, interact with. The map at the right is looking at um, housing affordability. So a lot of stewards talk about their work also in the context of gentrification and displacement. But in this instance, we'd love to hear your thinking. Um, the Mayor's Office of Climate Resilience is one of our sort of key partners when we launched the survey in 2017. And they're interested in both those sides, the sort of ecological effects of stewardship, but also the sort of social benefits and social cohesion. Um, so on the next slide, some of the ways we've started to, to think about that visualization are the civic capacity index that Michelle mentioned. It's just this really simple three variable measure, number of groups, number of staff, number of organizational ties at the neighborhood scale. But um, that's just one way. What are other ways that we should think about civic capacity? You know, knowing what we have, we have information about budget, we have the year founded of these groups. We could think about this um, over a time series. You could compare stewardship to sort of acute events that have happened over that timeline. Um, you know, the derechos and tornadoes and kind of extreme weather um, or other upheavals. And then what other climate change risk data should we be pulling in? You know, how can we use sort of the breadth and depth of NYC open data that are in the 311? Um, and then I meant I called out a few of the others, heat, flood, social vulnerability. But we really want to encourage you to think creatively here. Um, like, you know, we don't want to just adapt to the prior disturbance. We want to think about sort of broad system resilience. So um, help us think of the things and the pathways and the linkages that we haven't considered. So this could be, um, it could go in a lot of different directions. It could go in a data viz, or it could go in a more sort of analytic, develop a new index, or um, just putting the data in conversation with other data that we haven't considered. Um, and I think that's it, unless, Michelle, you want to add anything. No, I think that was great. Thank you, Lindsay. Do, do you have a Git repo that we can look at, or do you have any? Um, like that? We do that? don't, but okay. we can make one. Okay, okay, interesting. <clears throat> None of us are. Yeah, I, I, we, I mean, it's, it seems to me that when you, when you really start to do any kind of geoanalysis like this, if, if you know, your heavy Esri users, it really means one thing because your data, is, I mean, shapefiles are shapefiles, but you probably obviously use a lot of their analytic tools to be able to filter and slice and, you know, do the hexes and do all that kind of stuff that you want to do. So, I mean, I'm just curious. It's sometimes hard to separate the two, especially in a short scope kind of hacky thing like this, in my opinion. But. Um, well, well, Mike, um, you want to introduce yourself? And yeah, then sure, we'll, sure. And then I'm, we'll come I'm, back to see these questions. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I'm Mike Morgan. I'm in San Diego. <clears throat> I am a co-captain at the local Code for America Brigade, Open San Diego. I also volunteer, and I've just spent a fair amount of time doing some work with Hack for LA, which is the the uh, LA Brigade, and I'm just maybe going to start up a project with the Open Oakland. It's more air sensors and in the West Oakland neighborhood and how you try to uh, make sense of the pollution and stuff like that. So my background is primarily in um, 
information architecture and organization. I spent my, I'm a retired guy. I'm an old guy. And I spent most of my life doing um, semantic web type stuff. So it's ontology representations and queries and linking of data and things like that. I've also spent a fair amount of time doing lots of geo stuff, lots of high volume geo stuff, um, making maps, um, building reports, uh, building workflows, that kind of stuff. My, my uh, development stack is I'm completely 100% Python related and all the Python geo stack. I know the network stack pretty well and I do all my work in Jupyter. That's me. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, that's, that's fantastic. Who would like to go next? Uh, hi, I'm Jeff. I'm probably Mike because I guess I'm fim- 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 um, similar to Mike in that I'm a, I'm a uh, back-end processing guy uh, type of thing, moving the data around. Uh, I've been uh, with financial groups in uh, media uh, in the in the data engineering space for the most part. So of those projects, I think the text manipulation to representation is something that caught my eye uh, because of because I'm in that space rather than others. Um, yeah, they're just getting really. Uh, I live in New York City. I've lived in Harlem for the last uh, 15 years or so, and uh, just get excited that everybody's re- realizing what data data can can do and uh we're just like so many microcosms we're living together here in new york city so it's it's just a natural test case to to put the city uh to its to its bases cool great thanks jeff who would like to go next i can go ahead hi i'm steven um and uh let's see i um i'm kind of uh Somewhat new, I guess, to kind of the, the data world, and uh, you know, I've been kind of uh, I went to like a, a, a boot camp like about a year ago, and uh, yeah, I've done projects here and there. I've done a few hackathons, and um, you know, it was only recently that I kind of moved into the, the kind of geospatial kind of data world. Um, I've always had a love of maps. I, I really love maps. I love beautiful maps, and you know, I could just you know look at maps all day. And so, uh, I mean, some of these maps are so cool that you, you guys have shown us, um, you know, so, I, you know, I just, I'm kind of familiar with Arc, uh, ArcGIS because that's part of, so I'm taking a, a class on geospatial data science and, um, or data analysis. And so I was like, hey, why don't I do this? This is kind of cool. And I could maybe practice some of the things I'm also learning R, so I'm, but really my background is like, I'm doing most of my stuff day to day in Python. Um, oh, while I'm not so familiar with the geo stack of Python, um, I do, you know, I can, you know, I do a lot of like working with data, you know, it's like I'm in internships, like nonstop, just churning out data and just like day in, day out. So, um, you know, that I feel comfortable with. Um, so I don't know, I just want to be able to help out in whatever way I can, but also kind of learn some new things and uh, explore my love of geography and uh, I mean it seems like it's pretty cool I mean uh, some of the some of these uh, some of these projects and I'm kind of like ooh, I want to do this but I want to do that it's like <laughs> so it's kind of like a little kid a candy store kind of um, thing going um, that being said uh, I guess um, that's that's about it um, and yeah I'm looking forward to working with everybody so thank you very much for uh, putting this uh, whole uh, hackathon together great thanks Steven um, anyone else would like to go next? Do folks feel more comfortable doing chat introduction? Because if so, you could do a chat introduction. All right, well, maybe we'll call introductions done for the moment, but uh, hopefully when you guys get in your groups, um, and make sure to introduce yourself to your colleagues and give them a sense. Um, thanks, Mike, Jeff, and Steven for kind of saying, you know, here I live, here's what I do, here's what I program in, you know, that's really helpful, I think, for everybody to kind of get a sense of, you know, um, people as people and then also skill sets um, that people have too. So thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen again and we'll um, kind of shift into some of the more logistics. So um, goals are, so we've got kind of today up until um, Saturday at 4 p.m. And so at Saturday and 4 p.m., what we've kind of said is uh, let's kind of present back to you guys, present back to us. Um, what did you come up with, right? And so um, you can be as creative as you want, go in directions you guys want to go in. You can ask us what, what do we want to see, but really just we don't want to limit 
the directions you guys go in. So to get there tonight, first it's um, we'll figure out who, which team everybody's joining. Um, make sure everybody's already set up and able to join Discord. I can see links have been made, but I, I know at least one person was having issues. So I just want to make sure everybody can access it and, and get into the hackathon Discord um, and see all the channels and the like. Um, we're going to spend a little time more with kind of questions, and, and we've talked about what our possible teams are. Um, I will. I've kind of like said, here's where some of the data are. I'm going to talk more about um, some resources on, on Google Drive for you guys. Um, so that's where we kind of want to leave tonight is just like knowing what you're doing and, and getting with your small team and, and chatting about it. So tomorrow, um, it'll be working with your team. And then we'd like folks to join our office hours with um, me, Lindsay, John, and Erica from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern um, tomorrow on the all team voice channel in our Discord. And um, we'll put an announcement in Discord as well, just kind of saying, hey guys, come join us here. And that's just hey, a chance. Sorry, to... sorry. Um, so, where's the links to the Discord? Um, you should have gotten an email, um, but let me. That was in the ticket, or is this something completely separate? Right. It should have been separate. Did you just sign up like after like five o'clock today, Jeff? Maybe. Maybe then. Then that's probably why. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, here, let me grab the the link and put it in the chat. Sorry, I, I can never like navigate all these things when um. I found it, Michelle. You want me to drop it? Um, I just I just got there, so let me. Okay. Um, I'll try that. All right. So I'm back. Thanks. Okay. Great. Okay, so Jeff, after trying that, just let us know in the chat if that um, if you have any issues. So tomorrow you'll work with your team and yeah, come join us for office hours and it'll be just a chance to check in and kind of ask us questions further. Um, we'll be available like on the text channels. Um, you can you can ping us kind of tonight, tomorrow, and hopefully um, I have to teach a class in the morning, but hopefully. Um, one of us will be able to kind of respond if you guys have questions or, about things um, before the office hours or bring them to office hours and, and we'll, um, we'll talk through things. And then the idea is then on, like I was saying earlier, on Saturday, keep working with your team and then um, uh, we'll present to you at four o'clock Eastern on, on Zoom. And so that, that invite is to, it's open to anybody that wanted to register. Um, so if you haven't registered for like that second um, uh, part of the hackathon, you'll want to register so you get the Zoom link. And we can also just post that Zoom link in, in Discord as well. Uh, so that's sort of the timeline. Any other questions about anything on the timeline? Michelle, should I drop the link to the full hackathon resources folder? Yeah, that'd be great. I was about to do that on the okay. next slide. So that's perfect. Cool. Great. Yeah, so that should be um, the link that, that Lindsay just shared in the chat. And I'm gonna take a minute to um, just kind of show you what's in the resources folder, just so you, you know, I know, I know you can look yourself, but just to sort of talk you through it a little bit. And then um, as I was saying about the, the networks data, if you want to be able to access that existing Kumu project that I was talking about to play with it, go to um, the Kumu website, kumu.io, and um, become a, a, a sign up, get your um, handle, and then send me the handle. You can send it to, to me in Discord. That's my uh, handle in Discord in the team, or you can drop it in the chat here as well if you're already faster than that. Um, so I'm going to take a minute just to kind of walk through the, the folder. And um, so I, I've made this um, workspace place for folks. It's just, well, you can work in here or um, wherever your team chooses to work, but I just wanted to give you a spot to put some things if you need it. Um, slide decks are, are in here. And so there's the, the slide deck I just showed. And then there's also a slide deck that goes a little bit more into um, the background on, on stewardship. Um, that's from, we gave a presentation, John and me, on uh, last Saturday at the New York City School of Data. And then the data themselves are in here. Um, this 
uh, data set is on our website and streaming. That's the one I was showing you earlier. So it's got the geodatabase, the networks data set, the, um, uh, just the attribute table as a Excel, and then the data dictionary. So I just put it here. You can download it too from our website, but I thought it might be easier just to have it here. Um, these other two folders are things that are not um, right now open data and they're not um, available, but there's a methodology that this is very ESRI based um, that, that walks through how we made the um, uh, aggregating things to the neighborhood tabulation area. And um, in, I'm forgetting which one, I think it's the model outputs. You can actually access that um, civic capacity index, um, but there's other um, layers in there as well. And um, I should say, so we've got everything in file geo databases. I haven't um, moved them into any other format because I know that you can read them in um, to R, but if folks are want them to be in a shape file format, we can transform them. Um, export them as, as shape files. Um, the text analysis. So we have uh, a data set. This is the, the 2007, just so you can see what, what is already coded. Um, if you wanted to look at mission and code things that way. And, um, and then uh, the tweets are here as a CSV file. And so this is just literally like, what's the handle of a group, what's the tweet that they posted, what's the date they posted it, and what's a unique ID. That's that's really all that's in that data set. Um, so I think that's, oh, last thing is just, uh, I mean, you guys can, can look on New York City Open Data yourselves, but I just made a little list of, of some um, uh, green space data sets and um, environmental data sets, a link to the neighborhood tabulation areas data set and um, 311 call service requests. So I think Lindsay had raised that that was an option for me to look at, to think about in relation to ship to civic capacity. Um, there are many, many more open data sets. Um, just you can go here and, and search for other ones and think about if you're playing around with visualizations or thinking about the um, civic capacity and disturbance. Team four, there might be some other data sets um, there as well that I didn't I didn't grab. Um, let's see. So that covers that. Um, so just how we were gonna communicate. Um, I've talked about Discord. We made um, a general channel. That's the one that I kind of if the minute you join, it, it says to everybody else you've joined. I've made um, text and audio channels for teams one through four, and um, if you tag us. Um, you can see the the members. If you, I think Lindsay, Erica, and John all have their full names, and I don't. Um, but mine's M I C H J H J. Um, and just also wanted to talk about code of conduct since we're going to be working together in groups. I, I don't know that I didn't think that New York City Open Data has anything, so I just wanted to make a little a little kind of just hey, let's let's you know we're working together. Everybody's coming um, at this work with, with different capabilities, experiences, interests, and um, some people, maybe if you are, tend to be more of a talker, um, make space for others to join the conversation. And if you're someone that maybe is a little bit on the quieter side, you know, speak up, um, feel free to speak up. And so that can be either text or um, in, in um, audio conversations. So, and just wanted to again say that everybody's skill sets are welcome. I think there's you know space as these teams work together um, that that you guys can can make that space for for others um, and just everybody's viewpoint might might cause us to look and solve the problem in a different way. So I wanted to just sort of highlight those things. Um, and so now we're at the point where I think we're just going to sort of divide up into teams and I'm going to see what else I have. And, and, and talk about questions. So I don't know, maybe we, I'm not quite sure which one to do first, um, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see everybody. Um, and sorry, my, um, I have a four-year-old that lives above me 
I don't know if you guys can hear her jumping on the floor or not, <laughs> but um, uh, has everybody been able to get on to Discord? Is that um, working for everyone? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe drop hearing. the link again. Um, oh, no, Hannah said she saw it. She was messaging me. Okay. okay. Um, cause what we could do is, is sort of figure out, let's make sure every, before we leave the zoom room, everybody knows, um, what, uh, what team they're on and that they're like, they're able to get on to, to discord. Um, those are kind of the two things I want, um, everybody to be able to do. Um, so who is interested and you could either say this in the chat or speak up, um, who's interested in, um, uh, team one. Okay, so Amanda, you're team one. Okay, anybody else interested in team one? Okay. Um, well, let's see. Either Amanda, you could be your own team, or if you want to work um, with others, we can figure out um, where what everybody else is interested in and, and kind of merge you in there. So, who is interested in team two? The, the sort of like data visualization on all fronts, sort of very open ended question. You can add it to the chat or come off mute and say you're interested in it. Okay, that's Steven. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay, all right, thanks, Hugo. All right, anybody for team three? What if someone needs to see the data a little bit more before they make a determination? Like oh, with yeah, me, that's totally, like, totally like fine. Like with me, things, topic modeling, um, linking, just a quick look at the um, the, the Twitter stuff. Is it, it's not geocoded. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things one could do with that that kind of correlates it with the, you know, a higher level of information or content or knowledge. So I'm not sure yet between three and four. <laughs> How's that? Okay. Yeah. So everybody can see all of the channels. And so you can hop between things if you want. I was just trying to get a sense of like yeah. who wants to join what. Um, okay. So, I mean, another thing is you guys could all like talk as one group if you want and sort of figure out, you know, we can do that now or, or you can do that on discord um, you know, um, later this evening or tomorrow in the morning or something, um, things can shift, you know, is, it, is, um, is most everyone East coast? I think so. Except for, except for you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so let's do it in the nighttime. It's the middle of night for you guys. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of in the same situation. I, I, it, it wasn't clear from, from what's given so far, which would be the the interesting thing to jump into without sort of digging a little bit. So I probably would do the same thing as, uh, as Mike to start. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, new questions. That's kind of fun too. Can you get IRS data for these things? Yeah. It, I mean, it, it, so how do, is it, do you have addresses on it? So you have to relate an address to a place or you have a linkage from the organization to the place or do you even want placeness with it? I don't know. John, you want to jump in there? Um, sure. I'll try to, I'll, Put the link for the for the 990 data. Oops, sorry, I'm going to put this in here. Um, yeah, in this data set, you can find the group's activities or NTEE code. Uh, it also has a data dictionary as well, so you'll know what the, that group is working on with activity code. That is, you get like three different definitions of what they get, what they work on. And their address is written not always very well, but uh, as far as I tried, uh, yeah. coding is usually able to find a place for them. A lot of groups have uh, geo boxes as their addresses. For those ones, we decided to have a some strategy where we take the zip code and use the center point of the zip code for that group. So a lot of our groups are on top of each other. So I mean, simple basic questions like all the organizations you had in your network hairball there are in here have you even done that kind of level they aren't because um they're not all nonprofits. Uh, okay. so um not all of the groups we've surveyed have 501c3 status okay just curious but um it's it's been like so when we built a list to send the groups the survey one of the pieces we used was this irs data so we were able to say here's um, groups that right we know are nonprofits that might be stewardship groups. Let's send them the survey, but we also collected all these other groups that are not um, nonprofits and sent them the survey too. Does the state of New York publish anything? 
I think uh, it's all through the IRS. Okay, curious. Yeah, I, I dropped the link underneath what John dropped. And this is, um, there's a lot of work to now that the, the IRS is slowly over time, everyone's starting to e-file um, their, their um, for 501c3 status. There's been a lot of work um, and um, to how to how to collect those data, harness them, and, and look for things maybe that we are more or less interested in. Like other people might be interested in other aspects of the financial records of these groups. We're we're more interested in just who are they and where are they located and how can we send them a survey, right? But others might be interested in. Um, uh, you know, how much money, who are they getting donated from, things like that. And so th this um, link I, I put in here, um, it's, it's people that have been working with this, this nonprofit data from the IRS in different ways. And they have a whole um, effort. There's, I think, a subset of that. They work in R. So, so it looks like they published data. This, this made the whole day worthwhile. Thanks. This is good stuff to have. And then um, this is like a piece of theirs where this is their, um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to look for it, but this is, um, they've built all this stuff with R, I think. This is pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah, so I know, I know we've thrown a lot of different things at you and it sounds like folks need some time to, to digest. Um, happy to answer questions now or, or, you know, we can answer questions, all, you know, asynchronously as you guys are like looking at things and have questions for us on, on Discord to, to just fill in more or, or we've got those office hours tomorrow. What, what time were those office hours again? Uh, one o'clock Eastern, so 10 o'clock your time, Mike. Okay. So, so sort of a way to think about this is maybe um, looking through some of these um, tasks and requirements that you've laid out there and ideas is post I thoughts into the text channel on Discord and then just see if, you know, if I, ideas kind of coalesce a little bit so that um, you can start to build out a team. I mean, self-organizing teams is a little difficult. So, but, but I need to look at data before I can even offer an opinion about where I might help. That makes sense. Um, I, I think maybe we've got those four teams. Um, maybe I can, right now they just say team one, two, three, four on Discord, but maybe we could add the subjects there so it's a little more clear. So maybe folks could comment on ideas underneath the teams rather because I think what will happen if it's in the general chat is it'll all kind of, right, be a lot of, um, a lot of conversations in one place. Yeah, yeah maybe think... rather than having to like commit to a team, it can just be a place to start putting ideas related to a theme. Um, and you're, you're not like uh, signing up for life <laughs> or even right, right. for a day. Um, also, Michelle, if I could interject, I've been chatting a little bit with Hannah, who um, works for Parks on the stewardship team um, and like could also maybe offer some reflections as a current user of the data, if that would be useful at yeah. all, since she knows a bit about it. Yeah. Hannah, do you want to chat for a minute about the way you use the data or things you'd like to have that you don't currently have? <laughs> yeah, um, so I, just to give some background info, um, I work with the Park Stewardship team and I uh, conduct a lot of um, outreach for our volunteer events and specifically like looking for groups that we can work with for uh, strategic care events, particularly we focus, we're trying to focus on um, heat vulnerability index neighborhoods, so um, neighborhoods with high HVI. Uh, indexes. So we've been using the um, Stu map recently just to identify some groups you can work with, but I never, or seeing this, um, all this new data visualization sort of has been giving me more ideas of like how to, um, I guess, reach out to more groups and like sort of increase our capacity in that way. Um, so for me, it's, it's, I'm, I don't really have much of like a, you know, I don't like the, the data background per se, but more of like the, the usefulness of the data. Um, we use a lot in our, our practice. So yeah, the Stu map is definitely a great resource for us. So so the use case you're talking about would fall under team four, correct? Yeah, probably team okay. four. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just clarifying. Thank you. 
Thanks for sharing that, Hannah. I put you on the spot. I know no, that was okay. not scripted, but we were just it's okay. chatting. So thank you. No well, how, how do folks want to proceed? Um, do you do you feel like right now it, it makes sense to just sort of chat on the um, text channels under the different teams and then we'll, um, you know, we'll convene in person. Well, not in person, but um, on the audio channel um, on Discord at, at one o'clock tomorrow. We can, you know, give you give folks if you want to ask us specific questions or I don't know. It sounds like folks need time right now to really just sort of look at the data and and, and take it in a little bit. I'm definitely in that camp. I mean, I I don't know what to say until I know what's going on a little bit better. <clears throat> but but I I would still be inclined to say that <clears throat> as I look at things and an idea pops in, I would probably just put them in the Discord tech um text channel to say uh looked at this and maybe this is something to do that kind of thing because i don't really know when i the more i look at these they all have you know if i were to draw the venn diagram of these things there's some intersection here that's pretty cool i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just be, but that that makes the most sense to me any other questions or thoughts from anybody else I, I, th I think I missed uh, some on the on the first one about live data. Uh, is 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 it real time data when it says live data that's being um, used there, or, or um, what's what's the term live data mean for the for number one? I guess is what I'm I'm wondering. Yeah. Well, right now we um, did the survey in 2007, and then we did it in 2017. It's 2022 now, so groups have like the contact persons changed. Groups have folded. Our, our data are getting a little out of date and, you know, it's probably five years away before we'll do another decadal kind of survey, but we have these data up on the website and people are, um, uh, you know, contact information might not be good. So we want to offer a way for people to be able to um, uh, update their information and also to be able to find new groups so that they can add new groups. So I think John, right, the 990 piece is thinking about how do we, capture groups that we already have it captured and can groups can self-identify. I want to be part of the math. Yeah. Um, right. okay. yeah. yeah. yeah actually, I, I went to your presentation at the School of Data and I, did that. I didn't put those two together when I saw the word live data. But yeah, okay. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so that would be actually even soliciting new forms that are outside the nine, that your 990s are your, your potential candidates, right? Because you know they exist or they did exist. And um, you'd be looking for things even that maybe haven't had a 990 reporting. Mm -hmm. If they were a group, yeah. Yeah, so we were just slicing off a couple of pieces of that work that you saw, Jeff, and kind of thinking, like, how could um, a team maybe advance some of our thinking there? Okay, thanks. Any other thoughts or questions? I, I do, coming from the left coast here, I do have to say that NYC does an awfully good job with data. I love I, all the stuff that's going on with the open NYC and the beta NYC and all that. It's pretty awesome. It definitely is. And um, yeah, we benefit from it um, just with all of those open data sets to put our data in conversation with. Yeah, um, I only I only wish we were doing anything like that. You know, there, there's an initiative up in San Diego as well as L.A. <clears throat> with 311 data. <clears throat> so people always try to compare it with with what's going on in New York. But the kind of data that you have in the types of requests that you have in, in NYC and Boston are just so much better, you know, than graffiti and trash. That's like basically it in LA. <laughs> it's just boring. Yeah. It's boring. <laughs> so, you, know, gonna... you, don't house, you, mean you don't have housing complexes billowing black smoke uh, in your view. They, they, well, they might in LA, but no, I'm kind of close to the ocean here. <laughs> so no, I don't see that here. We have a restriction on how high you can go. Mm. This is California. I was going to say, going back to the live, like team one, I mean, we've spent the most time like thinking a bit about the 990s as a way to capture new groups because that's public data. But if folks know of other better ways or novel ways to identify groups, like we're game. I mean, a third of our respondents to the StuMap survey um Actually, no, more like half don't have 501c3 status. They're actually super, they're grassroots, they're civic associations. So there's a level of informality in this space that like we're never going to get from the IRS, like formal 
channels. So if folks have other creative, you know, social media scraping or, or, you know, even just suggestions on directions we could go, that would be instructive to team one. Um, and to this conversation about LA, I, I can't help on the 311 side, but I'll dangle the carrot that we do have map data for LA, um, oh, really? the LA River watershed and LA County. Yeah. Oh. So you can think of this as like, if you play around with and get familiar with this New York City data structure, then you can go and build a cool thing for LA. <laughs> oh, that would be okay. I'm, I'm more interested now. Awesome. <laughs> so, I mean, there must be lots of places. So these nonprofit kind of volunteer organizations, so they go, I mean, I'm hearing more and more, you have community, neighborhood community groups, you have all kinds of things going on there. Listen to, to a presentation today about the, um, the 311 and something called block party which was kind of interesting that how it fuses in LA, they have neighborhood councils, which are kind of a structural organizational thing that they have to comply with the various laws up and down the state. They don't have any authority, but they still have to report that way and be open and all that kind of jazz. San Diego, we don't have such a concept that I've been able to find, but yeah, I mean, I think some of these local neighborhood organizations, maybe that data exists somewhere else, just inside the open data portal seems to me, or you could infer it from the open data portal. Well, yeah. you could look into that. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, whatever. All right. Um, yeah, like I've noticed a lot of groups post on Instagram, um, you know, and have Facebook groups as a way of organizing, but those are not open, um, right, to scraping, um, which is a little frustrating because I do think uh, like Twitter is great, but I'm not sure that... Um, all groups use it quite quite as much, maybe some other platforms. But um, yeah, I, I mean, there's other places. Yeah, groups are presenting online, like you're saying, like maybe we're we're not thinking of. So yeah, I mean, to my knowledge, there's not one like sort of clearinghouse. You know, even our various city agencies, they all maintain their own um, lists of partners and groups, and you know, those lists get out of date and they're not coordinated and they don't talk to each other. I mean. That was the whole stage of building the database before we developed the survey. We had 55 different data providers, all that shared their list of groups, and we cleaned it and merged it. So there was a lot of work we did um, even before we got the survey responses back to try and get those, just to get names and addresses and emails of groups. Um, but we also know, you know, it's just a snapshot. New groups, new coalitions, they're formed all the time in response to the issues of the day. So how we can get a little more nimble about tracking that in real time. Um, it's one of the things, the decision makers, the, the folks, other folks that use the data are like um, city agencies, planners, natural resource managers, and they always want to know, you know, how can we keep these data up to date? Um, so that's our, that's our challenge. And, and even like what's a reasonable cadence to be doing the survey, we've sort of settled on 10 years because that's what we have the resources to do, but maybe there's some better interval. I'm not sure. So, so that um, brings up a good question. Your users are the people you just talked about. They're <clears throat> people in city government, uh, stuff like that. So that these nonprofits would never go to your site to try to find a, a network link one way, uh, way, one link away from me to go talk to or anything like that. Is that a customer? Well, they might. It's funny. I just got an email today. One of our, our data providers is IOB. They're a um, civic crowdfunding group. So they help small, like those, those hyper grassroots group raise money for projects, but they, they only know the folks that come to their platform. And they just wrote me today and we're like, can you just download me like all of StuMap? We want to send a offer for, um, you know, some matching opportunities that we offer. So IOB is like what we would consider a classic broker. Philanthropies want to fund them. They have connections to the grassroots. But again, they know like a piece of the elephant and they want to see the full elephant. So it, it is generally the larger citywide, either um, agencies or NGOs um, that are the main users. But it would be great if we could make some easy way to navigate the data from a group like sort of out or if they could use it then, mm, I don't know, to sort of raise their own visibility, to attract new people to them, to show their own prominence in the network. Some people have used it that way, just to say like, hey, we have an outsized influence in the network, even though we're a small, relatively neighborhood scale group. Um, 
like Gowanus Canal Conservancy is an example of that. They work um, and at the watershed level around Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn, but they're pretty prominent in the collaboration network. And they know that and they've sort of touted that in their own um, kind of fundraising appeals. So some of it is about like substantiating, defending the work that they do. Um, and I don't see it as much like the grassroots, like finding the grassroots. And is that just because we're clunky or people don't know where to find us or they want more interactivity? Um, so, I mean, I mean, in general, you know, network hairballs like <clears throat> like you showed with your Kumo or whatever it was, um, you really have to be somewhat sophisticated in how you're navigating it. So it, it's nothing like my geo is right here. Show me the people right around me that could help me because that's all I really care about. And, and the rest of this is just all too much for me. So you, can, can your networky oriented search support that geo notion? No, probably. Uh, interactive maps, you can say, here's where I'm located. Let me select um, okay. stuff around and then it'll select those turfs and those office locations Turfs. and you can export it as um, uh, just like a CSV. So, and so then, is it easy to get to the network graph from that? No, no so here's here's a challenge. Um, a limitation of Esri products is they don't deal with networks well. And, yeah, I know, I know you're not <laughs> Just <surprised>. kidding. <laughs> And we used to show, and we used to show those network links over our spatial map, and it just like it wasn't legible at all. So, and and we've always wanted to be able to show the way the networks are thick or thin over space, and we haven't, you know, solved that from a data viz standpoint. We end up going one of one of one or the other routes, with the exception of I think that capacity index that we pointed to, which has a network measure in it. And I think it's simple, simple enough that aggregated to the neighborhood scale, that's just number of groups, number of staff, number of network ties. So you can at least say, you know, like a lot of, you know, mayor's office folks want to know, where's my civic capacity, strong or weak, you know, um, but that's just doing one very coarse thing. I think there's, there's a lot more to be done to figure out how to kind of harness and power the sh- harness and show the power of the networks over space. And we're kind of limited um, with Esri. Networky things like to go big. <clears throat> I mean, I mean, I think they like to show the complexity of it all. But at the end of the day, you know, I live at XYZ 123 Oak Street. I'm in neighborhood A. I want to know the neighborhoods around me, geo-like. You know, I want to know that I'm, I'm bounded by C, D, and E. And I want to know we have common things that we're working on and common people that are doing it. Just simple things like that. And I want to see it you know, maybe as a PowerPoint, maybe, you know, or uh, PowerPoints, Google, whatever, whatever those things are, or I want to, I, I want a list of the people I can contact that are doing similar stuff. It seems to me that that content is in your network, but, you know, it's hard to search, hard to navigate, hard to extract it in a simple way. Simple use cases. Well, we would love yep, for you and we- I should stop talking. I'm sorry. No, I can go on. No, and on. it's <laughs> no, it's actually really helpful because we've been inspired by things like um, we have these community health profiles that the Department of Health puts out that are like you know neighborhood scale, taking a lot of complex health data, putting it into sort of like that fact sheet mode. And John and the Savvy team sort of made some wireframes for it, but we haven't built it out. And it would be cool if users could just go in and be like, boop, boop, boop. I want to know about East New York and this and, you know, kind of build build those reports on the fly. Um, I think that's what some residents would want to see. I think some council members would want to see that. There's a lot of folks who are just like, show me show me what's going on in my place, sort of what you're describing. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I want to be able to task it, the word I would say. And then I want to get up on Monday morning and get my briefing as to what's new and exciting and happening in my hood. And, you know, and then links to, you know, here's where I go talk to, here's, here's somebody that a new organization that has showed up or a new problem that has showed up and, you know, and how can I start to address it? But, but just standing orders. So somewhere when I was, when you were going through the data, I saw something that was a, one file was the nodes and one file was the edges. Where where was that? (laughs) Uh, so especially you get all of your graph data there. Yeah, so it's in the um, uh, the folder, the Google Drive folder under data, and it's called, uh, let's see. So if you look in the NYC 2017 CMAP version two, 
there's it, there's a just a XLS form that says um, networks, and one of those um, tabs says elements. That's the node list, and the other another one says connections. That's the edge list, and elements and connections are Kumu speak for edge list and node list. So it's it's already formatted to work in Kumu. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, another thought I had going back to StuMap Live is, you know, Google has all of its businesses and, and kind of locations, right? I know Google's over time, like it was Google local for a little while and now it's just on Google Maps, right? Maybe you have a point. Um, and, and often sometimes like with these civic groups, not just the nonprofits, but the community groups might be in that Google space, but we don't have, we don't really know how to scrape it, access it, use it. And so that's where that organizational schema idea or conversation came up is like, we were talking to, to Noel Hidalgo about it and he's like, oh, well, there's a whole schema for organizations. We, you know, how, how programmers are trying to standardize things, right? So like Google, how Google is putting things into um, Google Maps and, and identifying, you know, what this, what the group name is, what the address is, whatever, that this all using certain... Schema.org, schema.org, schema yeah. it has so everything. How do we link, we've yeah. formatted our data in a certain way, how do we link it up with something like that? That That's mm -hmm. where we're, we're just not uh, well-versed in that. But that that type of ontology design is interesting to you? Yeah, because if it allowed us to be able to scrape um, or connect our data with other data sets, or search search your own data set or publish your own data set, if would you like to have? Is that a you know you have schema markup for your own stuff? That would be super useful. I'm yeah, just curious. Um, but also, I, yeah, I think a way to put our data in conversation with other data sets like right now we're doing it where we're taking other data and, and we're filtering it to our use but how yeah how do we connect ours back out um like so um the charity navigator guide star one of those has a sort of like turf kind of definition how like we have like what is where does this nonprofit work i mean i looked at it one day let me see if i can dig up the link and i was like oh my gosh they're doing stuma um, but how would we put our data in conversation with, with, you know, something like that, where they, their platform is, is the entire United States and they're able to have this spatial representation, not just an office location, but a turf of, um, these different nonprofits. Like if we were able to have our data be in conversation with that, that would be really powerful, but we don't really know how to do that. Let me see if I can find that link. And Lindsay, did you talk at all about the, um, Opportunity project data set. Oh, Sorry. I just dropped the I just dropped the Mapbox prototype in. Um, so we participated in this data sprint organized by Census, and we made StuMap data available from New York and Baltimore and San Juan and a couple other places. And Map Mapbox was there, and um, Mikkel, I'm forgetting his last name. He he built us a prototype. Um, but we never got further than that. So um, I dropped that link. I don't think any of the other ones, Michelle, I'm trying to remember any of the other concepts, if they were worth sharing, I could go, I could go digging, but that was the one that felt the most realized mm -hmm. in terms of um, just s slick, legible, quick, easy, honing in only on the geography, the turf kind of simple presentation and quick, quick searching. I think those were the things he emphasized. I don't, I lost my chat because my, my computer rebooted. So I'm back on the phone, but I, I put that in a while ago. Yeah. If anybody needs me to paste it again, I can. And I, I do have his whole, like, he, I'm not a GitHub person. He shared his like error list and things he was working on. I don't know if people would want to see that too. That was like his working task list file. Would that be helpful? Yeah, sure. Okay. Maybe. Let me find that. It was like stuff that was like breaking or he was struggling with. You guys work with Top, the Opportunity Project guys? We, we did for like a sprint. Um, we basically handed our data to them and then they connected us with um, these different uh, tech companies like Mapbox. 
So when was that? When they like 2018? 2019. 2019. I mean, I, I, you know, their, their concept is interesting, but it's, you know, it's agile and it's hard and it's broken. If you're trying to do this volunteer stuff, it's pretty tough. I, th I think, the, you know, kind of the way the hack for LA guys do it is a much better approach to this thing called agile. <clears throat> so, but they do have some smart people and I was on a call with them earlier today. So they're, they're doing some fun stuff with their innovation lab for sure. And they're at least listening when you complain about their data and their website. Um, I think I'm just going to take the, the chat um, and paste it all in a uh, Google Doc in the um, folder so that folks, if anybody wants to like refer back to anything, they have all the links once we drop off. Anything else, Michelle? I don't, I don't think so. Um, I'm just giving folks a little space to see if any more questions came up. Um, and, and if we are perusing data later tonight, and just post a question in the general or something that you guys might see it or yeah, is, that you the right try, way, is that the right way to do it? Yeah. If you can try and tag us so that um, I get pinged that mm -hmm. it'll be more likely to respond or I'll try and check before I oh, that's okay. Okay. turn in for the evening. Yeah, like I, said, um, I, well. to, I, I just have to re look at some of this and yeah. see if there's anything I can do to help. Well, also, I'll just say, I mean, thanks to you guys. We, you know, we're, this is really a um, experiment for us, just to sort of, you know, see see what how other people, look, you know, can use the data, think about the data, visualize the data, and and any any time you want to give to this, we're we're happy for, and um, you know, our our we're just excited to have some folks looking at the data besides ourselves, you know. Do you have a database behind this? Are you like post just people or? Uh, John is he had to leave um, well, yeah like my my personal um, experience extends to R and um, and ArcGIS so it's pretty limited and John has uses things like PostGIS and Python and GeoPandas and stuff so, so you do persist this data somewhere besides geodatabases and, shape, and zips and shapefiles and stuff like that there's a query I could run somewhere to generate those kind of data sets. Yeah. Um, you could um, ping John. He's we currently he's building things in JSONs and then converting them to geodatabases. But the these data sets are older, and so they are not that way. Okay, it's not important. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. No, um, and we welcome any thoughts you guys have. We, we're we're um, you know John aside like. We're researchers thinking about how to collect the data and analyze the data a little less so on how to structure the architecture of things. So we welcome any feedback there. Well, we're, we're kind of getting near the, the end of our time anyways, but it, it, if there aren't any other questions, I'll just say, well, we'll see, see everybody on, on Discord. All right. I'm going to duck out. Great. Thanks, right. everybody. Nice to meet you. Nice to Thanks, meet you. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. Take All care. Right. Have a good night. Good Bye.